level indicators there because recording is on there we go and i will put the recording on so uh this course is intelligent image processing uh imaging image processing wearables uh, and by wearables i mean generally technologies that become part of us like uh you know even a car is like loose fitting clothing and uh, we wear, in some sense, we wear all humankind as our clothes, as Marshall McLuhan said. So we're talking about all technologies that humans interact with. And that includes, um, you know, wearable computing, smart cities, uh, smart cars, all kinds of technologies that we engage with in our everyday lives. So uh, I'm here at home in my, in my home studio. I have three labs at the University of Toronto, which are all closed. And... This is, I guess, my fourth lab here in Toronto, which is just my house, which I've sort of using as my uh, space to, to teach and learn in. Uh, so uh, this is my workshop here. Uh, I've got um, various artifacts here that are useful for teaching and demonstration purposes. So this oscilloscope my father got for me in my childhood, it was broken and it didn't work properly. The dot only went up and down. The time base didn't work on it. So that led me to some important discoveries, though, because, you know, I put it, the time base didn't work on it. So I was impatient and I put it on rollers, let this so I can slide it back and forth and see the waveform and photograph it. And I accidentally discovered something very interesting when I connected it to a police radar. And what I discovered is that it became part of the measurements uh, the Doppler shift it induced became part of the quantity that was measured. And I discovered this thing called augmented reality overlay of, of reality. So what we call what Charles Wyckoff and I later coined the term XR or extended reality for. And there's about 50 of us at the IEEE that formed the Council on Extended Intelligence uh, to chart the future of humanity and AI and machine learning. And that all kind of started with these very simple observation here about uh, seeing and understanding the things that are around us and the phenomenon, phenomena that are around us in everyday life. Uh, in the studio here, I have uh, an overhead camera here pointing down at a table, which is a whiteboard. And the table, the table is a whiteboard that allows us to see and understand, uh, present things. I've got a backlight on the whiteboard and I've got a chalkboard that I can put on top of it if we want a black background. Over there, I've got some of my artifacts, some underwater pipe organs that I've out in front of in my studio. Uh, you can see out on the, on the street here, it's a little bit, I guess it's a little overexposed, but you can see outside there. I've got a mannequin with three foot long spikes on it as a social commentary on social distancing. And I've got the hydraulophone, the, world's first underwater pipe organ, underwater musical instrument, which is another example of something I call natural user interface. I coined the term NUI, natural user interface, for this kind of interaction between humans and machines that occurs naturally. And then I've got lighting. I've got a ring light on the camera to get a little bit of face light. So even if I'm wearing a ball cap or something, you can still see me. And then I've got a couple of video lights here and I've got natural light coming in. So it should be good. Let me know if anything can be improved and we'll be happy to strive to do the best we can to give the best quality lectures possible given the pandemic and the current circumstances. So um, uh, let me switch now to the chalkboard for a second just to give an overview of some of the topics. Uh, so uh, this is ECE 516. Um, I'll be giving... Uh, an introduction. <clears throat> I'm going to explain on Jitsi how to. So uh, the first thing I want to do is show everybody how to operate Jitsi. So I will switch back my camera here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I'm going to share screen one. Share. Now you're sharing my screen. And of course, you see video feedback because you're seeing yourself of a self of a self infinitely many times. Uh, and that, of course, gives you an idea of how quickly if I put my hand there or something or if I move something, you would, it feeds back. So now uh, to do Jitsi, uh, go into settings. So if you click in the lower right hand corner where all the dots are and go into settings, um, under settings, you've got profile 
and just enter your name here. So like if I put in here anything, I don't know, let's say I put Dr. Steve Mann or Prof. Steve Mann or whatever it is, and I click OK, uh, that'll update. So if you can just please put your name there so that we know who everyone is, and I'll get to, I'll try to get to know you all. Um, and then uh, over time, the best I can. Uh, in terms of the scheduling, I'm gonna just turn screen sharing off for a second and go back to my document camera. <laughs> um, in terms of, of scheduling, we have three lectures a week. Um, the Tuesday and Thursday lectures are always going to be recorded. The Monday lecture will either give it live like this if it works well, if it's successful and people like it. I want to do what works best for the students. So if there are technical problems like internet and that becomes a problem, let me know and I can record also on Monday's lecture. Um, I have a questionnaire uh, posted. Uh, we put on Quirkus, we put a questionnaire, which I want everybody to let me know what time zone you're in and what convenience these lectures are. And I can set up additional office hours or if, if people are in an uncomfortable time zone, which makes it, if there's a difficulty, um, give me a poll, opinion poll of what time zone everybody's in. Um, the other thing that uh, you can do is let me know if there's any restrictions in the country you're in. For example, if in your country where you're in right now, is YouTube restricted? Is Google restricted? Google services or anything restricted? And uh, if so, we'll work around these. Uh, I will perhaps create a YouTube channel if that works for everybody, or if some people have difficulty with that, let me know. Um, uh, we have labs. We're going to have five labs this year. Usually we have 13 labs, but I'm not here to personally help people. I usually come, uh, generally in the past, I've come to all the labs. I've been here for um, since 1998, teaching since 1998, and I have never missed a single lecture or lab. Uh, and I've always been to every single lab. Uh, so a lot of professors don't come to the lab, but I feel strongly about the involvement of coming to the lab. So I'm gonna do what I can here to help people individually. Um, I'm trying to take an authentic approach, which is a blend of MIT and Stanford. So uh, um, at, at MIT, we have the East Coast. I studied at MIT. I was actually born in Hamilton, Ontario, near here, near Toronto. And I grew up in this area, Toronto area. And, and uh, my brother's a professor at University of Waterloo. Uh, so I'm um, sort of from here, but uh, I studied at MIT. I got accepted at MIT and I went there and founded the MIT Wearable Computing Project. And while I was there, I invented HDR, High Dynamic Range Imaging which is now used in just about every uh, commercially made smartphone and so on. And so the work that I was doing was, was of interest on the East Coast, on the West Coast. So I was brought over to the West Coast and I got exposed to Stanford culture. And so uh, there's a big difference between East Coast and West Coast. So what I'm offering here is a nice blend, what I think is an optimal blend of East Coast and West Coast culture. Um, the textbook is Intelligent Image Processing, published by John Wiley and Sons. Um, and you can find that textbook. The, the course website uh, has lots of information and background. And uh, so now let me, and in terms of wearables, of course, I've got some wearables. These are the Blueberry eyeglasses, blueberryx.com, which I'm wearing now. Uh, for example, I can show that I'll, sh I'll quickly switch back to that. Um, let me switch. Let me uh, switch to. So now I'm going to go to screen share, and I'm going to share screen one, and then I will go back to here. So this is my stats. This is my um, eyeglass stats in real time transmitted. Uh, so the blueberry eyeglass shows us what's happening inside the brain. It's a great kind of mental health monitor, and it shows what's happening in and around us. So now what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, some of the inventions and some of the, the discoveries. Now, here what I'm presenting um, is uh, a, a short slide deck. And uh, on that slide deck, I'm just going to go through a whole bunch of different things. Uh, a lot of it, it's beyond what's in this course, this initial introduction that I'm going to give 
is an introduction to my entire life and many of my inventions and discoveries. And I just want to familiarize yourself with, my, with, with something that might seem unusual. It's this MIT method. When I went down to MIT, what I discovered or learned, which was really amazing, is that the lectures are fantastic. Really, really great lectures taught by the, the people who actually invented these different fields. So it's typical at MIT that you take a lecture from the person who invented that field or that thing. So what I learned, it opened my eyes immensely. At MIT, what I learned is that the professors that I'm learning from are the ones that invented the things that they're teaching. And that was a real, uh, like they say, it's like taking a drink from a fire hose, but it was beautiful. It was like a, a wonderful frolic in this fire hose of knowledge. And, and so, uh, for example, I, I, uh, my mentor when I was at MIT was Marvin Minsky. Uh, and he was the father of AI. He invented the whole field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And him and I, uh, him and Ray Kurzweil, the chief engineer of Google and I, the three of us ended up writing a paper charting out what we think the future of humanity should be. And so I learned, I learned AI from the person who invented AI, Marvin Minsky. I learned computer vision from the person who invented computer vision, the founder of that field, Bertolt Horn. So in each case, I learned things from the people who invented those things. And that is a really different way of learning than learning at second or third hand. And so what I want to do is bring you that kind of learning. So I'm going to begin by teaching you about, uh, by explaining and showcasing some of the things that I've invented and, and that I'm interested in so that you can let me know which of these things are of interest. And please give me feedback. Please let me know if there's anything that I cover in this first week. This first week is going to just be very simply an overview of myself and my life and some of my inventions. And what I want you to do is to tell me which of those things is of interest. I've chosen out five things for the labs to focus on. I'm happy to adapt that to student interest though, because I will, if there's something that uh, a number of you are interested in, I will be happy to jump right into that. So a lot of this, may seem unrelated or some of it's related some of it's unrelated but it's surrounding context and so i want to just go through that and i won't finish this slide deck today i won't even hope or try to finish it but what i will do is give you an introduction to the first part of some of the things that i do and in the time that comes next uh, uh, over the next couple of lectures i'll take you on a journey of my own discovery in life and hopefully this will be inspiring and we can then narrow down what's relevant and what's of interest specifically to you, especially with your help and feedback. So now I'll go to share screen on here. And so wearable computing, its origins. And so one of the things is with, wearable computing history and future so it's about self and technology if you if you think here what we have is this notion of we have self and the technology around us and that is a kind of framework uh back in 1974 i came up with this concept uh, called wear tech uh, in my childhood which was kind of a new way of thinking about technology as something you wear something that's part of you um, I grew up in Hamilton, Ontario and got accepted at MIT and went there. And then while I was at MIT, a lot of my inventions became of, of interest. Some of my inventions like HDR, high dynamic range imaging and other inventions became of interest to Silicon Valley. And I was flown over there to HP labs to help them get set up on this and a bunch of other places that I helped there and Stanford University. Um, eventually my wife and two children and I moved to California to live at, you know, uh, in Palo Alto at Stanford. And I kind of became very involved with Stanford. And so I was back and forth between East Coast and West Coast, getting a blend of both of these technologies. MIT is the crazy lunatic fringe where people come up with new inventions. And Stanford is where those inventions are grown into industries and markets and Silicon Valley. So it's a perfect blend to, to create something at MIT and then bring it to the world through Stanford and Silicon Valley. 
And then from Stanford, uh, 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 we moved our operations to Shenzhen. I have a place in Shenzhen and also a place in Xiamen. So there's a, there's a, a, a natural trajectory here. This is my home uh, uh, in Toronto. On the roof, I have the world's first photovoltaic roof membrane, which you don't see here. It's, it's a, uh, uh, behind the solar panels, there's an actual roof membrane that's, that's photovoltaic and generates electricity. I've got the world's first rooftop mounted wind turbine in the center there. And then to the left, there's a weather station that monitors the weather and wind speed and direction and so on. And so what uh, I've been looking at is what I call environmentalism, uh, environment and environment. And so we'll talk more about that. And we'll start to understand that with our self-driving car project and our electric vehicles project in collaboration with Ford Motor Vehicles. Cars are just another form of wearable, loose fitting clothing in a sense. Um, this is uh, my house in Palo Alto. Uh, my wife and two kids live in the house with me and I spend most of my time in the garage inventing and creating and building things. This is one of my inventions, which is a virtual reality exercise machine, uh, which I can talk about as well. Um, this is a desk that uh, one of my students and I made out of a single slab of solid redwood. Um, so we responsibly harvested a, a piece of redwood tree and, um, and and finished it all by hand, sanded it all down by hand, and made this into an augmented reality desk. This is uh, one of our labs in Silicon Valley, Man Lab Silicon Valley in Santa Clara. And these are some of the inventions that uh, I've introduced that have gone out into the world. So wearable computing is out into the world widely. Uh, HDR is widely used. I've invented and designed and built the world's first smartwatch, uh, which and smartwatches are now a, a kind of common thing. Uh, another invention in the lab was OpenVidia, which was the predecessor of CUDA, which then became uh, uh, inspired uh, OpenCL and so on. So the GPGPU, parallel GPGPU was, was, came out of our lab. I coined the term OpenVidia for this because NVIDIA donated a bunch of equipment. I approached all the graphics makers and, NVIDIA gave us a huge equipment donation, so I called it OpenVidia, and, and naturally my student, when he graduated, went to work at NVIDIA, and out came CUDA, and all these other great things from that. And another one of my inventions is called the Natural User Interface, or NUI. Uh, Microsoft loves that. Um, so some of these inventions, uh, they're uh, are out in the world, and what we've tried to do more recently is to to kind of guide this process of bringing them out into the world, not just inventing things, but in terms of bringing them out into the world in some way through this sort of partnership with industry. Um, a lot of students that I, uh, uh, I, I like to try to mentor uh, students, I don't know if you can see that, I'll, I'll bring it up a little bit bigger there. Um, uh, so, uh, Ryan Jansen, while he was my student, um, he raised $65 million and won Innovation of the Year Award and founded a company, a uh, transportation company. Another one of my students, Chris Amini and I, together with James Fung and others, founded a company called Interaxon that makes a product called The Muse. Interaxon was founded right here in, in my home. Uh, originally, its office was my house here, my live workspace. And uh, uh, over time, the uh, over a period of time, we we got uh, this into you know a twenty eight million dollar company raise, and we were the headline act for Ontario at uh, the Vancouver Olympics twenty ten, with the CN Tower and the parliament buildings in Niagara Falls lighting all controlled by brainwaves as an interactive exhibit that kind of got us started. And now we've got a product that's sold in Best Buy stores all across North America. It's on amazon.com. The media referred to it as the number one in wearables, the king of wearables, the holy grail of mindfulness. So we've got a lot of good traction and we're always looking for students who like to make things so if you like to make things, join us. This is my uh, student, uh, Raymond Lowe and I, we founded a company called MetaVision and raised $75 million US and 
created a Silicon Valley startup. Um, and most recently, we have a company, uh, we just founded a company called Blueberry, blueberryx.com, which is the brain sensing eyeglasses. And so it tells you if you're dragging, it's got a head up display that reads your brain and your mind and tells you what your internal state is. So if you're dragging, you're low on oxygen, it shows up blue, which indicates hypoxic. So when I'm at the wheel and I see my light come on blue, I know that I should take a few deep breaths to make sure I don't fall asleep at the wheel. Uh, when you're rushing or being rushed, it shows up red or orange or yellow or so on. We often use the color magenta because red creates a positive feedback loop that makes you rush because you see red. Uh, when you're in between, uh, I call it on tempo. You know, it's it's like you're you're kind of you want to stay in the green zone in the middle between rushing or dragging. I'm using a kind of whiplash metaphor here. Uh, Blueberry X, this is the brain sensing eyeglass. This is a long exposure photograph of the eyeglass showing uh, on the to the to to my right to the, on the left in the picture there is a robot that makes that scans and, and shows you what you're seeing and it is a long exposure photograph that shows and we'll talk about this meta sensing and meta vision sense sensing sensors and sensing their capacity to sense so this is a selfie that i did uh while sitting next to my robot that has lights on it that move around in space that trace out the locus of points and the sensing and the lighting is combined in a way that allows you to scan the brain the mind the body various things and make all these phenomena visible uh, this is our uh, website blueberryx.com and uh, we have the eyeglasses there for pre-order so that people can can order this this product so wearable computing, augmented reality vision, uh, what I called originally a wear cam and wear comp, and it was a, this crazy idea from my childhood in the 1970s. I grew up in the 1960s, 1970s, experimenting and building with all the all these different things, um, attaching them to my body. It's kind of funny. A lot of people refer to me in the media as the world's first cyborg, you know, because. Uh, at least the first cyborg to be recognized in government context because you know this issue of the passport came up whether what's a true and accurate likeness and all of that sort of thing and it was kind of like well this has been part of me since childhood and it's sort of it is me and that sort of thing and kind of going back and forth on that so it's been a fun and interesting life um this is the you uh, kind of the evolution of the itap technology and this wearables and wearable technology there is a, a, a 45 degree beam splitter with the eye. So you, you see over the nose bridge, there's, a, there's a, a camera here and then it looks like I have a glass eye. Uh, so we used to call it the glass eye or the eyeglass or we used to just call it glass because it sort of has that glassy look that it looks like you have a glass eye. Uh, it was funny when Google called their thing glass also because it doesn't, didn't quite implement this phenomenon where it actually causes the eye itself to function as a camera in effect. The ITAP principle uh, is that the, the eye itself becomes a camera in a sense. And if you search ITAP, E-Y-E-T-A-P, all one word, you can learn more about this. There's uh, rays of eyeward bound light from reality are reflected off into a camera and then reinstated by means of a device that fills in that information back again into the eye in perfect registration and perfect alignment to create what we call a poe point of eye uh, sensing and, and display in which the eye itself functions as if it were both a camera and a display ieee spectrum volume 50 number two uh, the itap principle the aramac is a device that i invented which is the etymology of that word is just camera spelled backwards it reciprocates or uh, in reverse what the camera does. It's a laser scanning system that redraws onto the retina uh, what the camera picked up. It has infinite depth of focus, so everything is in focus from zero to infinity. Uh, everything from the dust specks on your eye out to infinity in perfect sharp focus. So uh, one of the interesting things is when I came down to MIT in 1991, I founded the MIT Wearable Computing Project, and Nicholas Negroponte, the director of the lab, 
kind of recognize this as something new. You know, he said Steve Mann founded a new discipline. He, he Early on, he recognized this as something of importance. This is kind of an historic video of him in his own words, kind of describing what happened when I brought this invention down to MIT. Totally different. It's, 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 it's a very, very different time for us. Steve Mann was uh, building wearable computers in high school. And I think it's it's perfectly good example that here's a young man that brought with him an idea that was very much on the lunatic fringe. It was very much something that people thought, well, this is kind of weird and it doesn't really make sense. And when he arrived here, a lot of people sort of said, wow, this is very interesting, and faculty became more interested, and he, and it's a, I think it's probably one of the best examples we have of where somebody brought with them an extraordinarily interesting seed, and then it sort of, you know, it grew, and there are many people now, so-called cyborgs in the media lab, and the people working on wearable computers all over the place. What I've got is I've got a computer screen in my glasses. I've been experimenting with uh, something uh, what you might call um, wearable computing or person, you know, personal computing. The real thing here is that it replaces a lot of the normal things that we carry, such as camcorder, uh, still camera, um, Walkman, um, pager, cell phone. All of those personal electronics items are subsumed into a single apparatus because you know I have a camera built into the glasses so that as I look around, the algorithm that I've developed seamlessly stitches multiple pictures together and makes them into an image composite, something I call painting with looks. So you can see that that last part there uh, uh, was uh, an example of look painting. That's one of my inventions, which was uh, panoramics, uh, making pan panorama stitching images together. Uh, so this is the little group that I, I, I started at MIT. Uh, originally, there was just a small group of us, uh, cyborgs, so to speak, or whatever you would call. Um, when I got there, there was no wireless service. I uh, sort of snuck up on top of the roof of the tallest building in the city and put a radio repeater there with a microwave downlink to the roof of this building, the Media Lab, and then brought that wire down the outside of the building to the open window there into my office. Uh, and this building, it, it looks like a, a, a kind of an inside out bathroom, you know, with these tiles on it, giant tiles. So it was really easy to kind of hide a piece of coax between the cracks and the tiles and pull it down into my window to a 19 inch relay rack full of my own equipment that I built. And so I got uh, the probably the world's first, you know, kind of wireless data network for this community of cyborgs working. And so back then it was kind of a crazy idea, but uh, I think Negroponte, Nicholas Negroponte, recognized that Steve Mann is a perfect example of someone who persisted in his vision and ended up founding a new discipline. So Negroponte recognized that as something, as a new field of research or something worthy of further work on it. Uh, my childhood was much uh, inspired by my grandfather and my parents who taught me many things. My dad used to build things uh, when he was growing up, and my grandfather also built things. My grandfather taught me to weld when I was about four years old, uh, and I learned to see and understand the world. But I always thought there was a better way to see and understand the world. So I thought, well, there's got to be some way to see this massive dynamic range between the brightness of the electric arc and the dark surroundings. So I kind of came up with this idea of a welding helmet that what you see there is a 45 degree mirror uh, which is the the welding shade uh, and the lens the camera lens is pointing down looking bounce off the mirror so it looks like i have glass eyes so that's why we used to call this glass because it looks like i've got glass eyes there and so uh, what you're seeing is you're seeing into the cameras and so i'm seeing the world through these cameras and therefore i can process everything that i see and moderate or mediate down what i see so that, for example, the damaging rays of the electric arc, so your eyes are truly protected from the damaging rays of the arc, and yet you can see in total darkness at the same time. And so this is kind of my one of my inventions, HDR, and, and how it kind of... Here's an example from a quantigraphic camera mounted in a welding booth to show a group of students how to weld a hydrolophone pipe. Notice how we clearly see the Weldcraft cup 
the tungsten electrode, including the tip, and the filler rod, as well as the glow of the molten metal. Now I have the quantigraphic camera on my helmet so that I can see the welding process on my head-up display. The special camera can be mounted on or in a welding helmet or on a tripod or on a special stand in the welding booth, or it can be handheld by an assistant. Notice how we see the details in the hydrolophone pipe, such as the serial numbers on the pipe, at the same time as we can see the glow of the tungsten electrode and the surrounding weld pedal formation. Each hydrolophone pipe has a unique serial number. You can even see the details of the smoke emerging from the mouth of the hydrolophone bulb. So this is an overlay in real time, augmented reality, HDR vision, extended reality sensing. It's alternating current welding for aluminum. So you hear the, the sound of the, um, the arc because it's being modulated at the carrier frequency. stereoscopic vision. So this is uh, how you see in stereo. If you cross your eyes, you can actually see a stereo uh, version of HDR there was what I see through the device. This HDR video is done on GPGPU in real time on a wearable computer. That's pulse tag where it's pulsing the, the arc. HDR in everyday life, you know, imagine this would be great for self-driving cars, or vision, or any of that kind of thing. So originally I invented this sort of for welding and seeing extreme cases, and also to help people see as a form of digital eyeglass. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, it became this widespread thing that people use in their, in, in continuously in, in everyday life for just ordinary photography as well. So you can see in the mirror there, for example, you can see this bright sunlight that's in the mirror. You can also see the HDR vision. That's the prototype that we saw earlier, prototype helmet, HDR welding helmet. And this is the uh, original explanation of HDR. Uh, at the top, there is the original input image. It's split out into these different uh, exposures that are multi combined. There's multiple differently exposed images that are combined uh, photoquantographically. So we're trying to measure or assess or understand the true quantity of light that's present uh, in, in, in the scene and understand how those images are, are, are combined together to provide. Well, first we compute uh, the actual true response of the scene to light and we, we calculate the camera response function and then we measure the actual quantity of light received at each point. So in a sense, it turns the camera into an array of light meters it turns a camera into a scientific measurement instrument. And this is a very powerful tool for computer vision and AI and machine learning because it turns the camera into a scientific measurement instrument. Up until this time, nobody was really asking, what does a camera measure? I was the first to ask the fundamental scientific question of this photoquantographic sense of what a camera measures, to say, what is it that a camera is telling us? So many, many years of digital eyeglass, uh, this is going back uh, to, to, the, to the early history. I, in 1998, uh, I then came out with this uh, single band, a headband that goes no hinges, just a single band that goes around a very more sleek and slender laser eye tap that provides this, uh, this computer vision. I want to sort of look back uh, at, at, at the context, the surrounding context of these discoveries and inventions. When I was growing up, this is what 
my grandfather's radio looked like, the radios that we'd have around the house looked like this. Uh, in, you could look in the back, the back was open and you could see inside it and understand it clearly and transparently. It had these vacuum tubes in it, which are like light bulbs and they're clear glass and you can look inside and see what's in there. There's no secrets here, everything's transparent and open. Not only that, but the manufacturer even put a schematic diagram and parts list right on the inside of that radio. So you'd look in there and you'd see a complete list of, of all the parts that were in it, how they were connected. And this was, in a sense, the manufacturer wanted us to be able to see and understand how that thing worked and totally know uh, its principle of operation. <laughs> Here's a parts list and you could take parts from a Westinghouse radio and put them in a General Electric radio and vice versa. You could swap parts. The parts were all standardized. And television was also transparent. You know, this is a cathode ray tube and you can see right inside it. You can see this is from the 1930s when you could actually look inside things and see how they worked. And then more recently, we got these things. This is a burglar alarm, a microwave motion sensor. And when I looked inside it to see how it worked, I noticed that the manufacturer had ground the numbers off all the chips to make it harder to understand. So we went from here, uh, the manufacturer helping make it easy for us to understand how things work, uh, and, and, the, and the company, the seller being your friend, to the seller being your enemy. Uh, here is where the seller is like declaring war on its own customers versus the customers as friends. So there's a big transition that I noticed in my childhood from uh, the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and so on. Uh, now, if I take that same microwave motion sensor, it's a secret mystery. And when I put it on an oscilloscope, I can't quite understand what's going on. Uh, it's very difficult to understand that waveform when you look at it on an oscilloscope. But what I noticed, of course, is if you move the oscilloscope, this is a long exposure photograph where I turned off the uh, x-axis, I turned off the time base and moved the oscilloscope in front of the radar set and the dot only went up and down and it traced out the pattern. So this is going back to the understanding and my daughter, of course, uh, she built this little exposure. She made this long exposure uh, with, a, with a track, with a race car track. So you can very clearly see the electric and magnetic fields here um, that she was able to uncover by moving an object, uh, a light source that was just bobbing up and down in front of this radar set. And then she flipped at 90 degrees to get the magnetic field. So you can see the electromagnetic waveform coming from this microwave motion sensor. Uh, in a sense, this technology, uh, aug you know, augmented reality, X reality, we call it, um, uh, makes every day, makes a lot of these phenomena that are otherwise hidden, visible and graspable and understandable and really easy for people to at least intuitively get a grip on. People of all ages can understand, see and understand and interact. Um, what I discovered is something I call sitting waves. Uh, it's not standing waves. Standing waves are well known. Standing waves arise, for example, when you have uh, a violin string. It has nodes and it goes up and down or a skipping rope. And the standing wave is or may be thought of as the sum of two waves that are traveling in opposite directions. What I discovered here, this is the world's first photograph of an electromagnetic radio wave. This is what I took in my childhood. Uh, with this uh, device. This is a crawling wave right here. It's not quite locked in, but when it locks in, there's it that finally sitting. This is what I call a sitting wave. Uh, and what this is, is it's more or less the product of waves traveling in the same direction instead of the sum of waves traveling in the opposite direction. And one way to think of it, this is a comparison of a sitting wave with a standing wave. Um, one way to think of it is it's a shearing of the space-time continuum in such a way that the speed of wave propagation is zero. So one way to think of it is it's as if you're moving along at the speed of light with the wave so that it appears to sit still. And uh, so we can, we, this is the apparatus. This is the early apparatus that I designed and invented, designed and built in order to be able to photograph electromagnetic radio waves. And this is a little bit of fun that I had as a sort of cyborg performance artist of sorts unwittingly that I became because a lot of people liked this style of photography. So it was featured often in 
different art galleries and things like that. Uh, and it was, um, this is a, an advertisement that I did for a, a hair salon uh, using circularly polarized radio waves being photographed along the railway tracks as a guide, using the railway track as a guide to slide this apparatus along because I often used a rail, an optical rail of some sort to move the apparatus. Um, <clears throat> here is a sort of proverbial hello world with this invention. I think it was the first. You see a lot of people make these clocks with things that whip back and forth and trace this out. I think uh, what I did predates a lot of that work, so this is probably the first example of this sort of thing that was featured at the Smithsonian Institute, the National Gallery, Stedelijk Institute, um, and uh, various other places like that. And at some point in time, uh, it started out kind of as a crazy art form, but at some point in time when I got accepted to MIT, it started to become taken a little bit more seriously as augmented reality or overlays or that sort of thing. So this is the world's first wearable computer on exhibit here at the National Gallery. Uh, it consists of this 35 electric light bulbs, which are connected to this wearable apparatus here. And uh, this is a, a modern, a slightly more modern LED replica using light emitting diodes of the same phenomena. Um, this is Neil Harbison. This is, and so we have this ability to see and understand these otherwise invisible phenomena. Here is the meta glasses, the meta vision eyeglasses. Um, I coined the term meta vision for the vision of vision, sensing sensors and sensing their capacity to sense. So a, a meta conversation is a conversation about conversations. A meta joke is a joke about jokes. Meta argument is an argument about arguments. Meta data is data about data, such as the you know, GPS header or, or uh, information stuck at the beginning of a JPEG header to show you where the image was taken. Uh, this is what I called meta vision, which is the vision of vision, seeing sight. And uh, so this is our company meta vision eyeglass. And this is a little kind of intro to MetaVision. So that was MetaVision. Unfortunately, our CEO made a, a few bad decisions, and uh, so we don't necessarily. Uh, uh, it's it's still uh, around under different management, but uh, this is the thing with startups: is you got to try about a hundred different startups before you get one that grabs. So uh, this is another one of my inventions. Here is the contact lens for information display. This is uh, going back to 1999 about uh, 22 years ago and uh, this is the world's first uh, implantable camera system for the blind this goes back about 21 years uh, uh, this is the this is what it looks like and this is what it looks like in somebody's eye uh, and this is we had a number of collaborators here we had two filmmakers working with us to bring this my eye for a camera concept into being uh, in terms of a, 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 an eyeglass prosthesis. 
uh, Dennis Desjardins, My Eye for a Camera, National Film Board of Canada, and Rob Spence, uh, filmmakers who brought my invention and technology into the sort of world. Uh, here's another invention, the world's first uh, smartwatch, 1998, uh, cover of Linux Journal two, in the year 2000. And here's a, uh, another, invent, another invention, which is this brain sensing headband. Uh, this is a device that you don't wear it in your everyday life. You tend to wear it uh, every morning or so to train your brain for about five minutes a day to train your brain to be able to capture and understand your world better and exercise your brain. Here's a little bit of a background on it. Stress is a monster with a thousand faces. And this is what calmness looks like. This is Muse, the brain sensing headband, the calm in the eye of the storm. Muse helps you learn to manage stress, stay calm, remain focused, and accomplish more. Pair Muse with your smartphone or tablet, put on the headband, adjust it for a proper fit, and launch the Muse app. Close your eyes and let Muse guide you through easy brain training sessions. Every time you regain focus and settle the winds, you're building your brain's ability to calm itself. The more you use Muse, the better you'll get at calming the winds. The sensors in Muse monitor your brain activity the same way a heart rate monitor measures your pulse. Real-time audio and visual feedback gives you insight into how your brain is working moment to moment and tracks your long-term progress. The result? Good riddance, stress. So cope with this by using this. Muse, the brain sensing headband. Do more with your mind and more with your life. So that's one of the things is, uh, you know, just even just making these videos, we're, we're getting better and better at using open source programs like Caden Live for editing videos and making different things like that. So um, we also supply that technology to eyeglass makers. So our Muse technology can be retrofitted into other products such as eyeglasses. So this is an example of a third party company that's incorporated our technology into, into what's looked like everyday ordinary eyeglasses. Life and sport are filled with chaos and distraction. <laughs> We train to be better. Now we can train our mental game. Introducing the Lowdown Focus, the first ever brain sensing eyewear for performance in the critical moment. So and so the the uh, and our latest product is the is the sleep band, a sleep lab in the comfort of your home, and this is a soft band. It's more like clothing or fabric. It's just a headband that you wear, soft computing, uh, and it monitors your sleep throughout the night, and so it allows you to keep track of your your sleep quality and so on. So this is these are examples of of products that we've taken to market. And uh, uh, so in the next lecture, what I will do is I'll continue along this trajectory. So I'm going to post recordings of uh, uh, the lecture of this, of this presentation all the way through to the end. So there's some history and some background and some different uh, takes on it. There's an amazing thing that happens when you have this vision, when you have eyeglasses and technology like this. Let me stop, let me go back to my... Uh, um, 11 here to my Jitsi meet here. And so there's a, an ama amazing things happen 
when you're able to to put this eyeglass like the eyeglasses that i'm wearing now uh sense what's happening inside my head they monitor my brain they, there's also a camera vision system in it it's got head-up display and so it sees and understands what's happening in the world around it and relates that to the context of what's happening in the brain so it's what we call the environment which is inside of us and the environment which is around us so i will talk more on the relationship between the environment and the environment in terms of intelligent image processing because when we now have computer vision uh, that we have with us at all times it gives us a visual perspective on life that is quite uh, new and refreshing and exciting um, so please give me some feedback uh, in the in the comment section I, I see that uh, loud and clear I think my sound is okay let me know if the video is good um, I've got my sound indicators on there the uh, volume indicators I, I can probably turn that on um, and uh, yeah let me know your thoughts on the lecture and if there's anything in particular you want to see take a look at the website tell me what you like about the labs tell me where you are geographically located tell me what equipment you have access to. I'm going to try to make the labs very easy to do at home. Uh, mostly programming software, computation, a little bit of building stuff at your kitchen table that's fairly easy. I'm going to start out by having everybody build a camera, a little pinhole camera. It's not a difficult exercise. I've given this to many children to do. It's a, even at the elementary school level, it's something you can do. Uh, but it'll help you understand how a camera works and then we want to build a mathematical model for a camera and we want to understand everything from fundamentals so that you understand from fundamental physics how things work and how to invent and design new things if you're going to invent new things you have to understand things from fundamental physics i always said if you learn machine learning uh, machine learning is built on probability theory and probability theory is built on measure theory if you really want to understand machine learning, you have to understand measure theory. You have to understand the foundations. Otherwise, you, you'll end up with a very shallow understanding of, of these fields of research. So what I want to do is give people a very deep, broad, and also deep understanding of fundamental physics of imaging and image sensing and meta sensing. So uh, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. And um, I see we've got 37 people here. And uh, uh, I hope you found this interesting. Give me lots of feedback. I'm happy and delighted. You can email me man at itap.org and put ECE516 in the subject line because uh, I get a lot of emails. Um, uh, so um, just as a, so yeah, if you put that right in the subject line, wherechem.org, ECE516, or, or just put ECE516 in the, in the subject line, I've got 190,249 messages in my inbox now, so I got to be able to make it stand out by putting EC516 in the subject line. I'll respond right away because this is top priority. My uh, wife and children come first, and then second, right after that, are my students, and then everything else comes after that. So if you put EC516 in the subject line of the email message, it has the only thing more priority than that is if I get something from my wife or my children. Thank you. Someone in the chat asked of when is the first lab. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, when is the first lab? So labs are not until two weeks from now. So we're gonna the labs are gonna be every two weeks, and the first lab is two weeks from now. Uh, we've out, I've outlined it. It's there's a bit of a schedule. There's a schedule on the website that shows that indicates the date of each of the labs, and the first one is on the twenty fifth. And so if you go to, actually, I can even share screen. Um, uh, I'll go to here. I'll go to, let me uh, quickly show you where, how to find your way around, uh, wherecam.org. So my, by the way, the talk slides that I've got are wherecam.org slash HTML5 slash man keynote slash superhuman machines. So if you just go to that URL, you can actually see these talk slides that I just uh, gave uh, and look at the talk. Uh, I'll, let me back up on that URL and go to uh, ECE516. And then you've got here, this is the EC516 website. Uh, at the bottom, you've got schedule and you've got labs. So if you click on schedule, it'll give you a schedule. Um, uh, and the brackets are parentheses, the curly parens are the, I just did a cal command from the Unix command line prompt. And I just VI'd that using VI and I put curly braces around each of the days that has a lab associated with it. So there are five labs and those are the dates they occur on. 
If you also click on labs, there's a bit more information 